after this class was over, well, let me back up. At the end of the class that I just recorded for you, I asked the question, or I left it up to the students to decide if they agreed with the earned statement that beauty is truth and truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Well, that day I left class and I was putting my kids in the car and whatever and I was driving home and I was thinking about whether I thought that statement was true what all the way watch? home. What are you doing? What I ended up doing is typing a long email and sending it to my students. I thought, I think that this discussion of the poem would be more complete if I were to read that email here. So I'm going to do that. One of the things I was thinking about on the way home from teaching this class, I was thinking about the meanings of truth and beauty, and St. Augustine came to mind. He wrote in his confessions, Long have I loved you, O beauty, so ancient and so new. Now in that line, he is addressing God, and he is calling him beauty, with a capital B. So, in that sense, in the sense that both truth and beauty refer to God, then of course the urn's statement is true. And so are the last lines of the poem. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. God is the height and summit of all mortal knowledge, and of course the mystery is far beyond that. So the question is then, is this how Keats meant us to understand beauty is truth, truth, beauty? We can see from our exegesis of the poem that you just listened to, that he seems to be presenting the urn's words. This urn is a historian as the truth of the truths of mankind. This urn is standing out of time, unaffected by time, and touching eternity, or at least it, quote, teases us out of thought, as does eternity. These lines can also be read in the same way I've described beauty and truth. The mysteries of God and eternity do tease us out of thought, so to speak because we cannot measure nor understand them in our limited human nature. So again, is Keats touching on this reality or not? Certainly the timeless nature of the urn seems to point that way. It too touches eternity, but really I can't say that I think Keats is pointing directly to God as I have done just now. Keats doesn't address God in the poem. He uses an imaginative urn in the imagined images depicted on it as the subject matter. And that points to me, at least it seems to point, more to human art making, which, by becoming a work of art, the urn in the poem, it transcends the transient elements of life, which by necessity all pass away. And that's where its unchangeable immortality seems to come from. But the poet does suggest, through his bridal language, there's a sense of mystery and transcendence. One of the students pointed that out in class. And he also presents a sacrifice to the gods in the fourth stanza. So the poem does occur, concern itself, at least in part, to the worship of the divine. Um, so it touches on it some, I think. Now, how are we to read Keats' presentation of truth and beauty as equal? Beauty is truth and truth beauty, okay? Are the truths of life he presents on the urn true because they are beautiful and beautiful because they are true? I would say yes to both. And this is the consolation to man the urn brings as far as Keats is concerned. This beauty cannot fade. It exists in the imagination, which stands outside time and decay, and it shows man who he is in the best moments of his life, recording them for eternity, quote, in the midst, midst of his woe. Now, I would argue as a Christian that Keats's argument in the poem is true because the best moments of life are the best because they touch God, and I'll list them. Love and marriage is our partici participation in the love of the Trinity, Sacrifice to God is God coming to us in his flesh and blood, and making art is our participation in the work of the true artist. And the best moments of life are the best, because God himself lived as a human being. The true consoler of man, in the poem, remember, it's the urn. The true consoler of man is God made man, right? I'm talking about Jesus Christ, of course, who suffered all the woe of mankind and then glorified his nature opening the happy, happy gates of heaven, where the ultimate completion and consummation of all man's joys in life, in love, worship, and art, will come to be in union with him. I am referring not only to the individual soul's union with God in heaven, as Dante describes at the end of Paradiso, but ultimately to the parousia, when God will be all in all. You know, the end of time, the second coming of Christ. 
Keats does not go there in his poem. He doesn't reach this truth. No. For him, the urn presents beauty in incompletion. Remember, the lover can never kiss, the heifer can never be sacrificed, the song can never end, and the poet makes a point of this repeatedly. So perhaps we can go so far as to say that in the poem, the incompletion itself is why beauty can exist at all, because once the joyful moments are complete, they pass away. I would say, yes, that's true in this life, but not ultimately because of the reality of heaven and the kingdom of heaven. So in this poem, Keats seems limited to me, but the poem smacks of the real truth. And that's why I can say that I agree with the earth.